This is the Moonlight Graham Show, a freewheeling conversation with the role players, the underdogs, and guys with flat out great stories in sports. Hello and welcome back to the Moonlight Graham Show, where we celebrate the role players, the underdogs, and the great stories in sports. And I think this week's episode has a little bit of all of that. It's got a role player. It's got a heck of an underdog story. And it's one of the greatest stories I think we've ever told here on the podcast from an Iowan, nonetheless. Our Moonlight for this week is a guy by the name of Peter Jock. And a lot of you, as I say, Peter Jock, you're probably thinking, oh, yeah, I remember Peter Jock. Didn't he play for Iowa like eight years ago? And that's right. He did. Peter Jock led the Big Ten. He led the Hawkeyes and he led the Big Ten in scoring, averaged just under 20 points a game about eight years ago. He's you know 28, 29 years old right now, and he's still playing professional basketball, but he has never played in the NBA. And so Peter Jock's one of these guys that, you know, just missed out on the NBA, played in the G League for three years after Iowa and has since been playing professionally overseas. And you think, well, that's a story we've heard before here on this podcast. But what we have not heard before on this podcast is a guy that just qualified for the Olympics playing for his home country, which is the newly formed country of South Sudan. See, Peter Jock is from Iowa. He's an Iowan. He moved to Iowa when he was eight years old. He originally was born and raised in Sudan. And as many of you know, maybe some of you don't, Sudan's a pretty war-torn country with, with some tribes that have been warring for a long time. And so there was this big civil war that was going on 25 years ago. It's still you know, very much going on today. And Peter and his brothers came to America, and they settled in Des Moines. And when he was in Des Moines, he turned into a great basketball player. He had never played basketball ever before coming to the United States. And then within a couple of years after coming to the United States, turns out he was a heck of a ball player. And so Peter Jock becomes one of the highest rated high school recruits in the country, ends up going to the University of Iowa where he had a great career. And that's just a great underdog story in and of itself. This story of perseverance, this story of, um, you know, traveling across the country to find a new life for yourself here in America, finding success on the basketball court, getting your college paid for. That's amazing. Well, the interesting thing about this is over the past 10 years, Sudan now is kind of split into two and South Sudan is a newly formed country. I believe it was formed in like 2008. If I have that right, you might have to fact check me on that. So it's a newly formed country that is competing as an international Olympic um, country now for the first time. And so South Sudan now how it has its very own basketball team, national basketball team representing Sudan. And they uh, formed a basketball team for the very first time. They performed exceptionally well at the, at the world cup of basketball here recently. Peter Jock was on that team along with a bunch of other NBA guys. And Peter shot 68% for the tournament from three point line. Like, not only is he still playing hoops professionally, but he is literally one of the best shooters in the entire world. And that World Cup was a great stage for Peter Jock to showcase his skills against, you know, the best basketball talent in the entire world. And so having him here on the podcast, you know, a month after he qualifies for the Olympics and he's going to be playing in the Olympics next year in London or excuse me, not London, Paris representing South Sudan. It's it's an amazing, amazing story. And I'm so glad that Peter, we, we had him in studio here. He came over to the house. He's working out here in West Des Moines, getting ready for next season of uh, professional hoops. And, you know, he's one of these guys, and I love these guys because we talk about it so often on the podcast. We have a lot of guys here on the pod, and I, I love guys that have their career in the rearview mirror and they, they make for great interviews. But it's really fun to have a podcast interview every now and again with a guy who is in the prime of his career. And that's Pete. He is in the prime of his career right now. He's never been a basketball, better basketball player than he is right now. You know, not when he was in the G League, not when he was playing at Iowa. The best version of Peter Jock is right now. And so it's so exciting to see him. And we, we kind of saw this a couple of years ago with Colin Ray. If you remember Colin Ray, former UNI baseball player who had bounced around in Japan a little bit in the minor leagues and had this awesome comeback story. And, and Colin Ray has been in the major leagues with the Milwaukee Brewers for the last three years. Awesome, awesome story. And it was fun to get him here on the podcast. Peter Jock, kind of the same story where 
it felt like he was going to be like a first, second round draft pick out of college. It didn't work out for him. He's dealt with some injuries, but now late twenties, he's better than ever. And he's still got that chance to come back to the United States to play in the NBA. And he had such a great showcase this summer at the world cup. He's going to have it again next summer at the Olympics. And it's also so cool how Peter talks about sports and basketball unifying that country. And he's had a chance to go back to his home country with, you know, this World Cup Olympic experience. And it's just, man, I I feel really lucky to be able to tell the story here on the pod. And I think you guys are going to enjoy it, too. The other thing that I was thinking about, interesting thing about Peter Jock, he might be the best Iowan ever to play basketball and not make the NBA. Now, help me out on this. I'd love to hear feedback because... I was making my list, and it's a short list for sure because most of Iowa's best basketball players, you know, the Fred Hoybergs, the Harrison Barnes, the, you know, the the Murray Twins, Kirk Heinrich, Nick Collison, Kyle Korver, Marcus Page, U- Jared Utoff, Lauren Meyer, Ray Friends. Like these guys played in the NBA, and a lot of them had remarkably good careers in the NBA. And you know we've had we've talked about NBA players from Iowa in the past. You know, there's only been about you know 40 of them or so. But Pete has never played a minute in the NBA, and I think he might be the best basketball player ever. Here is my short list. One or two is either Gary Thompson. So, of course, Gary Thompson, All-American at Iowa State, fantastic athlete, chose not to go to the NBA, chose to play AAU basketball instead. So you could say, like, Gary Thompson, NBA caliber player that chose not to play that way. Um, So he's probably the best, if not for Pete. And then Pete's either one or two with Thompson. But then after that, like, who is next? Is it, you know, Jared Homan, who was a Remsen guy, played at Iowa State? Is it Matt Gatons uh, from Iowa City? I, you know, is it Wade Looking Bill from Fort Dodge? I don't know. The I would, I'm curious because I know I've forgotten about so many guys from Iowa that haven't made the NBA. I'm curious as to what that list looked like, and I'm asking for your guys' help. But enjoy today's episode with, you know, one of the greatest – Iowans ever to play basketball, Peter Jock, who's got this great story of of coming to Iowa, coming to America, realizing a dream of playing college basketball, realizing a dream of playing professional basketball, now realizing a dream of becoming an Olympian. Have a great week, Moonlighters, and enjoy the episode with Peter Jock. Moonlighters, are you or someone you know moving down to Kansas City? Well, if you are, the one realtor that we trust and yet you need to be calling, is the great Brian Sandvig. As you well know, Brian Sandvig is our producer here on the podcast, and there is not a better residential real estate advisor down in the Kansas City marketplace than Brian Sandvig. Call Brian Sandvig, shoot him a text. Hey, DM us on social media. We'll get you connected with Brian if you can't find him on all the socials, but he is there and he is active, and he is your Kansas City realtor, so give him a call. All right, we're sitting in my basement. I got (laughs) Peter Jock, who recently qualified for the Olympics on the podcast. Welcome to the Moonlight Graham Show, Peter Jock. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. So you came over to America when you were, what, eight, eight, nine years old? Eight, nine, yep. We're right in the middle of uh, October baseball right now, Pete. Mm -hmm. And as you can see from my basement, I'm a a baseball fan, right? Yep. I know basketball was a little bit of a slow burn for you. It took you a while to, you know, get a comfortable with ba- basketball. But baseball, mm-hmm. have you ever played baseball? Do you yeah. understand baseball? Like, do you understand why Americans care about baseball? Where are you at on baseball? Yeah, I mean, I played uh, baseball my uh, when I was when I was in middle school. Okay, most of my friends played uh, in the uh, Raccoon Valley. So when I didn't have anything to do, I just decided to just play with them for fun. I was terrible, but, uh, I hit, I hit a home run with my eyes closed. So that's, that's the best okay. memory, I, memory I have of baseball. But yeah, I do I understand the game of baseball. I mean, I don't watch a lot of it, but yeah, I understand the game of it. Cause I always wonder, you know, globally basketball is a pretty glo- glo- global game. Mm-hmm. Baseball is a pretty global game, but mm-hmm. not really in Africa. Right. Yeah. So your home continent, home, you know, country of Sudan, now South Sudan, they don't play much baseball there. So, yeah. but basketball was foreign to you when you came over too. So there wasn't much hoops over there when you were growing up. Yeah, no, nah, I mean, yeah, base. I mean, I think baseball is an American thing because even in uh, Europe, uh, they don't talk a lot about baseball. I mean, they have fans. 
because I mean they're starting to get international players and all that yeah, stuff, yeah. or has already started. But uh, yeah, when I was in Africa, we played uh, soccer. That's the most popular sport in uh, overseas in Europe. I, I'm in Africa, Asia. But uh, I grew up playing soccer, and then basketball. I didn't really start watching basketball until I got to the states, so I didn't know anything about it when I was back home. Uh, watched highlights, but yeah. didn't know anything about basketball. You just qualified for the Olympics, yeah. South Sudan, a newly formed country. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, South Sudan. How, how long has it been a country? Like eight years now, probably like ten. I think what was this twenty? It's this is I don't know, close to ten. Yeah, it hasn't been too long. I don't think what was it was 2011, I think. Right, because like a couple of Olympics ago, mm-hmm. folks from South Sudan that were in the Olympics were competing under, under like the international did, flag. Yeah, like yeah. they didn't even have their own flag. I remember, was it Gore Maker? Yeah. Do you remember that name, yeah, Gore yeah, Maker? Yeah. Who's a runner out of runner, Iowa State. Yep. Mm-hmm. And my brother actually ran track with him at Iowa State, and he ran mm-hmm. representing South Sudan under the international flag at those Olympics. And that was the, the first time I had heard about South Sudan as a country. What's it like for you now to represent this newly formed country and now to qualify for the Olympics, like what a, what yeah. an underdog story, and what what's that experience over the last few months been like for you? I mean, it's been great. You know, um, my mom works with the government back home, so there's a lot of lot of bad things going on back home with the war and uh, all the extra stuff. So people have been divided, mostly because of uh, tribes, different tribes. So that's been we've been divided back home. But to play to be able to represent for uh, South Sudan. Uh, it's been a great experience, especially when I went back home after we qualified for the World Cup uh, to see the, everybody smile, to, you, to see how united we were as a country just to support the team. And um, I think that's what motivates me, what mo- motivates everybody on the team, because just to see those smile and to see everybody coming together without saying uh, I'm from this tribe or the, or the other tribe. Uh, I think that's that's been that's been the most uh, special thing that uh that I experienced so far, and then all, and then to go to World Cup, and then qualify for Olympics yeah. to be the first team well, since we become our own country to go to Olympics, it's a it's a big deal. Um, uh, the whole country is supporting us, and right now we are the we are the team or we are the players that unite the whole country. So mm-hmm. just that's uh, that our number one motivation, and we're gonna keep going to do that. So. It's part of the young kids. The squad. Did you know most of these guys mm-hmm. before you yeah, know, yeah, coming yeah. together for the World Cup? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I knew most of them. Uh, most of them played in the States. So we have a lot of players that play in the right. States. And then also in Australia. So I knew them personally before basketball. And then after when we got together, it was it was easy for the chemistry to be for us to get on the same page. So prior to the World Cup, like how, how much had you guys played together? I'm always curious about international basketball because you've seen it with Spain. Mm-hmm. You know, you've seen it with uh, Brazil. Yeah. We're like you, you've seen it with Australia, like these these teams that have good consistency throughout the roster over like yeah. three, four Olympics. Mm-hmm. And so in the offseason, these guys are used to playing with one another and they've got great chemistry. But. South Sudan being a newer country mm-hmm. and you guys kind of being the first real legit team to come out of that country. How often had you played together prior to, you know, this run here? Not often. I mean, we, uh, when we started, this is our first team that we had, this is the first time we had a team, like a national team. So, um, we kind of got lucky to qualify for the Afro basket and that's how we started. But every round we don't have the same team because some, some guys, some, uh, some guys are either injured or some guys are playing, um, playing overseas or the NBA. So every round is different. We never had like a back-to-back round where everybody is the same team. So, but the good thing is we have a lot of unselfish guys. So every time we get together, it don't matter what group, uh, what group of players you bring in uh, to the team, we all end up gelling. So for me, I only I can I can only went to the rounds that I could go that my team let me in overseas because sometimes they don't let you go to those uh, certain rounds. Mm-hmm. So uh, every round is different. Um, Guys trying to make every round uh, the most rounds they can make. So, but we never have. We don't have a consistent team that every round is going to be there. If that makes sense. So, oh yeah. So yeah. to that point, because we've seen it with the USA team. Like yeah. the USA team is trying to figure out like what roster can we get away with, mm-hmm. you know, at the yeah. World Cup, right? Yeah. And they they got burned, right? Yeah. Like a lot of the best USA guys weren't playing in the World Cup. Yeah. And you know what? The gl- basketball is a global game. They're mm-hmm. going to get burned by that, and they got beat, and yeah. they missed the medal round, and. And so we've seen that with the United States. What I'm curious, because obviously South Sudan, you guys are like country heroes Mm -hmm. right now. 
I'm sure everybody's going to be coming out of the woodwork for that Olympic team. Yeah. So what's that roster going to look like in the Olympic? Like, is your spot solidified that you're yeah. going to be on the Olympic team? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, like you said, we're not USA. USA is the only team that have ra- random guys, not random guys, but, yeah, pretty much the random players go to World Cup. They don't really take World Cup series. They just let some guys go. They All the best players want to wait till Olympics because they're going to qualify for Olympics anyways. But in the World Cup, what I've seen is, the best teams are the the teams that have been together since they were young, right. and they can form a chemistry, and you can tell the difference. And that's only that's the only reason um, the all the European teams be winning, because talent wise, USA was the best team talent wise in uh, in the World Cup. But the teams that won is the teams that have been playing together since they were fourteen. And as far as for uh, for us going to Olympics, I mean. If they don't, if I don't make it, I mean we have a great team. So <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So as long as I say, as long as I say injury free and I'm healthy, I'm, I'm, I'll be good. So I'm not worried about it at all. Because who did you have? Who does South Sudan have that didn't play with you guys? Like I, I know Bull Bull, yeah, w- wasn't on the team. Uh, who for, else? Yeah, Bull 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 J T Thor with uh, Charlotte. Um, who else? I think those are the two, those two guys that were supposed to play with us in the World Cup, and then one of our three guys from. Uh, Australia didn't play with us because he was injured. But other than that, I think those are the three guys that we wanted for the World Cup team. But moving forward, I feel like the World Cup team is going to go to Olympics, and then we're going to add a few guys and then go from there. So training camp is going to be exciting. How is Manute Bull your uncle, and you didn't grow up playing hoops? Uh, he's uh, he's my uncle on my mom's side. Yeah. Yeah, so his his dad is my mom's dad. Uh, my mom, hold on. His, mom, his dad is my mom's dad brother or or something like that. I, I can't remember it. Mom but did you F. know, like, hey, yeah, Uncle I mean, Manu yeah, is yeah, famous yeah. worldwide. He's this great basketball player. You knew that growing up. Yeah, I mean, when we first got here, we uh, went to KC. We met with him. Uh, we had we uh, stayed with him for a little bit. Oh, cool. You know what I mean, yeah, I got so I, I knew when I was younger, but I was I was very very young, so I don't remember too much. But Dow does. Um, Your older brother. Yeah, but I mean, I didn't. Even when I first got here, I didn't know too much about basketball. So I didn't. Everybody's saying he's famous and all that stuff, but I didn't really, didn't really care or understood what that meant. I just knew him as my uncle. So yeah, and what he's done back home in Africa and South Sudan. I mean, going back to the World Cup, mm-hmm. like how cool is it for you? A guy that, like you, you've having a good pro career, mm-hmm. but a lot of folks on like the national stage, the world stage, don't know who Peter Jock is. Mm-hmm. Right, because it's like you played at Iowa, which you know you led the Big Ten in scoring. You mm-hmm. you were a good you know college basketball player, but then you're going into the European leagues, and frankly, a lot of folks in America we're not following the yeah, European yeah. basketball. So even if you're playing well over there, you're one of the best shooters yeah. in some of these leagues. It's like, uh, oh, is that the guy that used to play at Iowa? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's what they're saying. But then you're playing in the World Cup, which mm-hmm. for whatever reason, like people were really locked into the World Cup. <laughs> yeah. that, like it's the first time I was ever following the basketball World Cup. Mm-hmm. So I'm following you, and you shoot the lights out for mm-hmm. five games. Like you shot 60% from the three yeah. for the entire world cup. And you played some of your best basketball. I mean, Serbia who like everybody was watching that game against Serbia. Yeah. You had 21 points. You shot the lights out. Like, what was it like to play your best basketball on the biggest stage that you've ever played? Yeah. So, I mean, like you said, my career overseas has been uh, kind of up and down. Um, overseas, all about situation. If you're not in the right situation, it's going to be tough for you. So, uh, my first year, I was in a great situation. And the next two years, the COVID happened. And then uh, it was kind of a up and down situations. So the last two and a half years, um, last three years pretty much hasn't been, I haven't been in a good situation for me personally to to uh, to play the best I can. So um, last year, I went to uh, went to Greece and got misdiagnosed with a heart condition. So I didn't play most of the year. And then right before uh, the World Cup, I decided to go to France to finish the season over there just so I'm ready for the World Cup. So the whole summer, I spent the whole summer pretty much getting ready for the World Cup because I knew it was going to be my opportunity to get back on track with uh, with a good team or a good league over there in Europe. So I was really locked in in the World Cup, and I knew the the coach had confidence in me, and the players really – I shot lights out since training camp. My body felt great. This is the best I felt since probably when I first came out of college. And uh, so I, I took care a lot of my body – I took care of uh, my body really good this summer and then just pretty much focused on staying healthy. And then when I got my opportunity, I took advantage of it. When you talk about like good opportunities, mm-hmm. like it's got to be a good opportunity. What do you, what is a good opportunity? What's a bad opportunity when you're, you know, you're evaluating opportunities right now yeah. for what, like the next team you're yeah. playing for. Mm-hmm. Like, how are you evaluating what's good and what's not good? 
Uh, pretty much uh, the program. Uh, I'm not. Yeah, the pretty much the organization, not the program. The organization, uh, the situ- uh, the spots they put you in. Because most of, they put me as a three overseas, and overseas a lot of threes are pretty much three and then stay in the corner. So they don't get. They're not really great shooters. They can shoot, but they're not great shooters. To me, I can play two and three, and I like to come off pin downs. I like to move like with the move. Uh, um, what's the word? I like to play in a system where we're moving a lot and yeah. running, you know what I mean, running gun. Emotion. Pretty much the emotion, shoot. exactly. Yeah. But the teams that I've been in the last three years is pretty much telling me sit in the corner and then play defense. And then most of the most of the time the guys guarding me are right next to me because <laughs> I'm a shooter. So I don't get too many opportunities to shoot. And then and then people evaluate that and say, well, he's not really producing, but I'm not giving out opportunity to get shots up, you know? But, right. Yeah. Well, uh, like the the most famous, I guess, Iowa example of that is like mm-hmm. Kyle Korver. Like yeah. Kyle Korver made a career off of like figuring out how to get open, you know, running his defender off of different screens, beating his guy down the court, and he was never just in the corner. Yeah, Like exactly. he was everywhere but the corner, whatever yeah. he needed to get open. But mm-hmm. if you, you know, I guess you're, you're saying you like to do the same thing. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, just movement. I mean, I'm a shooter. I come off dribble. I mean, off the pin down. I can uh, shoot off dribble because I'm also a scorer too. And, I, you know, I, I grew up a scorer and then I just became a shooter because in overseas, if you're playing in the high – no, not overseas, but in the, as a pro, if you're playing with a great team, everybody got different roles. So for me as a, as a shooter, they want me to shoot a lot. So if you're not an opportunity, if not in a situation where they're running plays for you to shoot, you just pretty much out there just spacing out and then be a playing defense. So yeah, I mean shooting translates. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Like if you can shoot, if mm-hmm. you can make shots, yeah. and I think like guys on the Miami Heat, guys like a guy like Matt Thomas, mm-hmm. for instance, yeah, yeah, who I think you know pretty closely resembles your game, mm-hmm. whereas like. You know, you're a little bigger than Thomas. I think Thomas is like 6'4", you're yeah. like 6'6". Six, six. Mm-hmm. But a guy like that, he goes over to Europe, he makes shots, mm-hmm. he gets a chance in the NBA with the Raptors. Yeah. They've got an awesome system there with Nick Nurse where mm-hmm. he knows how to get guys open, get shots. Like, why haven't you had that opportunity yet? See, that's, that's, yeah, that's the you're question like, for that's the what, yeah, That's what I'm asking. That's what I'm trying to figure out, man. But, I mean, it, for me, I'm a man of faith. And uh, with my career so far, it has been – it hasn't been where I wanted to go or where I wanted to be, but everything happened for a reason. As long as, as long as I control what I can control and just keep working, you know, God's gonna put me in the right situation sooner or later. So, compare yourself now at 29 years old mm-hmm. to like Peter Jock, 22, leading the Big Ten in scoring seven years ago at Iowa. Like, mm-hmm. how is your game now compared to then? This is the this is the best I felt. You know, uh, I'm, I'm growing now. I have a different pace. Um, I'm way stronger. I move better. Uh, I've been really focused on a lot of mobility. To back then, I was just playing pretty much all about being athletic and uh, being able to shoot, get passed by uh, passed by guys. But now I've, I've been learning to take care of my body and different ways to uh, to score. And my de- my defense has been way better. So I've been. I, I feel I, I feel this is the best I felt probably since probably college. And um, I think my game right now is on. It's, my prime pretty much if I, yeah, I think I'm in my prime right now and that's why I'm just trying to wait to get in the right opportunity in the right situation so I can showcase that I'm I'm back you know so yeah yeah so you're living in West Des Moines Des Moines right now you're mm-hmm. getting ready for your next opportunity you just came from a workout at Valley mm-hmm. High School across the street mm-hmm. what are those workouts like for you now man so I, I work out Two to three times a day. So I wake up in the morning, probably like five, five thirty, and then I'll do basketball, and then afterwards I'll go to do yoga, uh, yoga, yoga, and then go home, sleep. I do intermittent fasting, so I get my workout. One meal a day or two meals. So two. I, I eat. I can only eat between twelve p.m. and eight p.m. So and then uh, after that, I have to wake the whole time till next day. But so I'm trying to get my workout early, get back, get some sleep, and then at twelve, twelve thirty, eat. At three, go to a lift. And then at night, get some shots up or go back, do some yoga or lit or some. But it's always two to three. Uh, I try I do yoga pretty much every day and then Pilates, too. So, wow. Yeah. So you're working out tonight. Mm-hmm. Are you working out alone or do you got like a, a somebody rebound in front of you? Somebody no, like so a, I, a workout coach. What do you got? I worked out by myself in the beginning. They had open gym. So the Valley team. So, I, so they, you were just yeah, working these high school kids. Yeah, I worked out. I worked out by myself in the beginning. And then when they started playing pickup, I started playing with those guys just yeah. to get some cardio because I just came back from COVID. So it's still 
still recovering. So yeah, so some of my buddies. I know you play with some of my buddies on Friday morning. Yeah, tomorrow, right? <laughs> so, you, so you got tomorrow morning, and I'm just always curious because I know there's some good players that play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. So there's some good players. Some some XD one guys will play mm-hmm. in that league, but then you got a couple of guys that I work with, right? Yeah, so they're yeah. insurance guys. Yeah, that are like six foot white guys that uh-huh. did not play Division one basketball. Yeah, what's that like playing pickup with just like re- regular Joes when you're you know looking to put yeah. your career on the next level? So pretty much I, I use that as a opportunity to get in shape or stay in shape, I mean. And uh, so I try to push myself cardio-wise. And uh, usually I'm guarding – me and Nick are bear usually guarding each other or DJ, one of the one of the top players I'm using. We guard each other. And then everybody else, it's not like um, – it's not like the uh, the only the good thing about this, the the morning runs is they got good IQ, so they just yeah. they're not just out there just playing and not knowing where to be at the, sometimes. But um, I mean skill, I mean not skill, but uh, <laughs> uh, what's the word? Talent wise, I mean that's not where I want to be, where I want to play. But at the same time, they got good IQ. They go the whole the whole hour without stopping, so that's great for your cardio. And I'm really impressed with how they do it, and they still hit open shots, so it's not like yeah. <laughs> They hit some open shots. It's, it's good runs. It's, it's good. It's, it's well organized. I know. I, I've played. I've subbed in that morning game a couple of different times. Yeah. And I remember the first time I subbed in it, I, I was shocked that they didn't have a like a water break. Yeah. You know, like the first game ends mm-hmm. and they, they just check the ball up and get into the second. There's, they play for an hour straight, straight yep. no breaks at all. Mm-hmm. And, man, it took me... It took me about 20 minutes before yeah. I was right, you know, because you go through that. Everybody's playing so hard at the start. Yeah. And then there's that lull yeah, they, where, yeah, like, yeah. you got to, like, settle into the game a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, and I was I was gasping for it. Yeah. Him. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's that's why I go there because uh, it's good for your cardio. And then, I actually, after that, I'll go do another cardio at Hot Works. I try to do bike for 30 minutes or do a hit workout. So, they actually got me prepared for World Cup too. So when I was here, <laughs> shout out to those yeah, guys. Yeah, because it's different between being in shape, just running, and then also basketball shape. So yeah, yeah. When you okay, so going way back when you first came over to the U.S. when you're eight nine years old, you mm-hmm. get introduced to basketball for the first time. Like when did you know? Hey, that this is a sport that I that I like. Number one mm-hmm. and number two that I'm good at. Um. I didn't. I didn't like basketball. I mean, my brother, my brother Dow, Dow Jock, he used to play basketball when we first got here. He used to walk to the YMCA. We lived in East Side, so he walked to East Side YMCA every day. Go work out. He would tell me come, but I didn't want to go. I was always wanted to play video games. And then <laughs> um, when I when I got to uh, yeah elementary school, we moved from uh, Willard, and then we went to Greenwood. And then when I got to Greenwood, most of my friends played in uh, Metro League. And when I, when they were playing, I didn't have anybody to hang out with. So I joined them just to mess around. Didn't really care about basketball. Just tall. And um, Mike Nixon, uh, who's my my guardian now, like my second dad. He uh, he had an AU team. Him for his son, and then a bunch of his friends. So he pretty much asked me to come play for him. Um, I didn't want to at first, and then my mom pretty much said, "Just go try it out." So and then how how I fell in love with basketball was uh he would take us to McDonald's after workouts and then I just kept going back from McDonald's and then at one point at one point he was just pretty much he sat down with me and pretty much told me <clears throat> I have potential to be uh to go to to go to college for free where my mom doesn't have to pay for a scholarship or, or for school and then also have potentially play a professional where I can earn money playing the basketball if I took it serious but it was going to be up to me so ever since then, I, I locked in, and he pretty much just pushed me every day. We worked out pretty much every day. <clears throat> every day, he's the one that taught me how to shoot. So seventh grade, uh, seventh yeah, seventh grade, I started getting better, and uh, I, it started being fun scoring and all that stuff. So uh, got my first offer in seventh grade. I think it was Illinois. No way. Mar- yeah. Seventh grade. Yeah, Illinois. So like Marquette. you had been playing hoops for thirty six months. I started playing in fifth grade. So then, you, two years. You've yeah, been playing for two years. Yeah. And then, yeah, seventh grade. How tall were you in in like fifth, sixth, seventh grade? Probably like six, two, six, three. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you could tell that yeah. you were going to be something. But yeah. So, yeah, got my uh, scholarship. Got a scholarship from, uh, I think it was Illinois or Mar- Marquette. Marquette was my first offer. And then ever since then, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to take it serious. Started taking it serious. He would push me every day, play me one. I uh, had me play one-on-one every day, him and his, me and his son. And we just kept pushing each other. And then 
that's when I pretty much fell in love with the game. When you were at, so I know you started high school at Roosevelt, but you ended up playing at Valley. Yeah. And then that Valley program at that point, like Jeff Horner, who's a really good college coach today, was the head coach. You had mm-hmm. Jack Brownlee on that staff. Jack's a friend of the show here. You had J.R. Angle yeah. on that staff. Like all these ex-Hawkeyes were coaching. What would you learn from those guys who all had, you know, Division One big-time experience? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the reason why why I went to uh, Valley is because of Corner and then all of those guys because they they went to college, they went to play to Iowa, and um, at that time I wasn't thinking about going to Iowa, but I just wanted to uh, learn from guys who have been to where I want to get to. And so when I got there, you know, I I seen the um, I talked to them a lot. They have a lot of knowledge for basketball, especially Jr. because he's been around basketball a long time. And I didn't understand how good Jr. was until after I went to college, and then I was hearing stories about him. But then, uh, oh, not Jr. Brownlee, but, uh, Coach Brownlee. <laughs> Brownlee oh, they're uh, not going to let you live that down. No, <laughs> nah, Coach Brownlee. Yeah, I mean, uh, Brownlee doesn't look like much. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. he could play. He could yeah, really he play. has a lot, a lot of knowledge with basketball. Um, Horner, obviously, you know, he played at high level, played overseas too. So we talked a lot, and he would tell me how college was and what to expect and all that stuff. So it was really great playing for those guys, and me and Brownlee got to be close. Pre- uh, we got to be really close, and he was always hitting me up talking to me when he watched games and stuff so that's my guy right there yeah so when you're at valley did you hurt your knee while you were there <laughs> no nah, i hurt my knee i actually hurt my knee my freshman year in, in uh at roosevelt and i played through my sophomore year and then after that i had surgeries at, at the end of sophomore year but it really and was t- it the acl no nah, patella Oh, man. Yeah. So how do you – I've always heard that because the patella is tough to do. Yeah. Like, how did you hurt your patella? So it was dunking. I went on a dunk, and I hurt something, and then sat out for the rest of the Nike – I went to – it was at Nike camp, and then sat out the rest of the camp, came back. I thought it was patella tendon, and then played through it my whole sophomore year. Uh, but I can tell, like, I wasn't myself, and then went to the doctor and got an MRI to say it's tore. So I had to get surgery that whole summer, <clears throat> and then that's when I transferred to Valley. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember, I was it your senior year or your junior year when you played the sub-state game? I think it was against Johnston at mm-hmm. Southeast Polk. Yeah. What, what year was that? Uh, if we played Johnston, that was my junior year. Yeah. Yeah. But you were unbelievable that game. Do you remember that game? Was I? I well, at least that was the first time I saw you play in person. That's when we uh, – is that year we played Woodbury? No, no, I'm talking about high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just in the in the game to go to the state tournament. Yeah, we and then we had to yeah we had to play Woodbury at a state. At oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I just yeah. saw the sub state game. Yeah, and so I went over there to watch that game, mm-hmm. and you were you were great that game. Oh, yeah. and I remember seeing like I was all hearing Peter Jock, Peter Jock, Peter mm-hmm. Jock, and you, I I didn't know how good of a shooter you were at mm-hmm. that point. I know you've gotten a lot better to, since yeah. then, <laughs> but like you were just had guys in your face all game mm-hmm. and just made shot after shot after shot. Mm-hmm. Like at what point during your high school career did you know that like I'm a big time Division One player? Because even though yeah. you're getting those offers in seventh grade, mm-hmm. like you're going to Nike camps, you know there's tons of better players out there for you. Like mm-hmm. when did you think like no 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 I'm I'm big time? Um, probably my freshman year when I went to the Nike camp. That's okay, when, uh, so that early? Yeah, because uh, they only invited 35 freshmen, and then everybody else was like sophomores. Because we Marcus Page and those guys were there, so it was all the top players. And then the first um, first couple um, uh, scrimmage, not scrimmage, but games, I was hooping. I was playing good. Won the three point contest in that camp. So I was I was pretty much saying like, well, shit, I belong. Like I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. And then hurt my knee pretty much. And then I pretty much had doubts when I when I hurt my knee because I went through a dark time. And then um, it took it actually took me till my sophomore year in college to be 100 percent because even uh, at that junior year we went to state. After we played our first game in the state, even if it would have won, I don't think I would have played my second game because when we got back from uh, after the game, my, my I couldn't walk because my knee was swollen. So, um, but after my senior year when I came back, um, I felt way better. But I've always knew mentally, I always had this confidence that nobody's better than me. So mm-hmm. I, that's how I grew up, and no matter what, that's how I always felt, and I always felt I was big time when I went to Iowa. So. You have a, some really good high school coaching. A lot of guys that you know get you ready to play college ball. Mm-hmm. But then, even when you go to Iowa, like you didn't play a ton your freshman year. Mm-mm. So even though, like I'm assuming the Horners, the Brownleys, the JR Angles did a lot to prep you for the college game. Yeah. What was the biggest adjustment that you didn't expect when you got to Iowa? Defense. <laughs> yeah, it was it was defense. Uh, I was only freshman on the team, so I didn't have a lot of uh, errors to make because Fran didn't. 
he said you had to you have to be um you have to learn quick or you're not gonna play. So I mean, my, my I had a good summer. I mean, I went overseas. Second, I was second leading scorer. Offense, I didn't have any trouble. I was scoring on everybody. But then on defense, I was getting killed. So he pretty much told me, if you can't play defense, I can't play you, and I don't care if you're one of our best players uh, on offense. So it that's I think that's the main reason why I didn't play a lot my freshman year. And then we was also stacked. We had a lot of players on the yeah, team. Yeah, who was on that team? Uh, we had uh, it was. Um, Jerry Utah, Aaron White, um, oh, yeah. Woodbury, Mike Gasell, uh, Gabe Olashaney, um, uh, Ogersby, uh, Dev Marble, yeah, those, Basabi, I mean, Zach McCabe. Like, that we, kind we, of run <laughs> of teams right there, it's shocking that none of them made a run in the tournament. I think that was the most stacked team we ever had. Because our, our second team was Anthony Clemens, me, uh, Jerry Utah, um, Basabi and Old Shaney. Man, Utah was good. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah, I didn't play a lot, but at the same time, it was motiv- motivating me. I wasn't prepared for that and how the intensity too. So it was. I had a tough. I had a tough freshman year, but it, it prepared me, and I didn't rush it. What is it about defense? Like, is it? I've always thought defense was about like focus mm-hmm. and about effort. Yeah, like if you that's if it. you care enough about defense, that's it. Like you can be a good defender, and if you try hard enough. But yeah. like, oftentimes I'm I'm always confused by how guys are like confused on defense. Like it's not that complicated yeah. if you're just locked in. So that, what what was it like? What was the? That's it. I mean, it's, I was just an offensive player. Like I didn't care about defense. I just <laughs> I know I'm gonna score. Just get uh, buckets. Yeah. So when I got there, I mean, when he told me that, I started guarding Devin Marble every day in practice. And He's I, tough. De- Devin and uh, Jarrett. I started guarding them. And my sophomore year, I started playing. Uh, I played more, and I was guarding the other two, uh, the other team, two best. Two guard, best two guard. So that whole year, I didn't score a lot, but I was he was making me guard the other two best uh, two guards, and and then sophomore year, you know, we had a good team, and then yeah. So I mean, um, going back to defense, it's like you say, how bad you want it, and just pretty much focusing in, because ever since I became a professional, my defense is elevated. Because now it's like I want to play defense, and then that's it's fun actually. Once you once you got once you get good to it, get good at it. So it's, it's been fun. What, who's the toughest guy you've had to guard? Toughest? In a game or just overall? Overall. Probably, I'll probably say James Harden or Devin Booker. When have you played against, like summer leagues? or? Because uh, I remember I signed with the Suns. Yeah. yeah. So, so in training, 17 in the summer, to 19, was, you were. Yeah. So in the summer, like I trained with the Suns. And then James Harden always come in the, in the Phoenix because he's from Phoenix. Oh, he, well, yeah, he, he went, went to school Arizona there. State. Yeah, he got to go home there. So we always had runs in the Phoenix. So we always played against those guys and then then Booker we played in the summer in the, with the Sun so and TJ actually TJ was really really tough to guard TJ Warren oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that guy's a scorer yeah he's tough he's long too isn't TJ Warren six, like 6'8 six, 6'7 eight? Six, eight, six, eight. yeah he's strong he, yeah I think he was probably the, him and James probably hardest to guard yeah yeah, so when you're playing those pickup games a little bit different than the West Des Moines pickup game that Hell you're playing yeah. in right so you're yeah. playing like might be 10 guys mm-hmm. Seven of them are like, you know, in the top 50 players in the world. Like, they're just yeah. crazy talent. You see some of these videos that go out of like these NBA pickup games. It's it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Like, do you ever get hot in those games? Yeah. Do you ever have a game where it's like, oh, man, I, I lit up Devin Booker, yeah. you know, during one of the. And like, what's that feel like when you know your game is at the same level mm-hmm. as some of the top players in the world? Yeah. I mean, when I when I on that first summer I went to Sun with the Suns and I was playing with them, I was shooting lights out. And if I want to hurt my adductor, I feel like I had a great chance to sign with the with the Suns. But um, I feel I mean I felt great. I mean, the NBA is all about situation too, being in the right situation. Um, if you take advantage of that, I feel like you'll be good. It's kind of like a fraternity. Once you get in and you pretty much stay consistent with what you do best, uh, you're gonna they're gonna take care of you. So playing with those guys, I mean, I didn't feel like they were better than me. I just felt like it's basketball, you know, and especially when we out there, you can pretty much open gym. So it's not like you have to pass it to one person every time. So, I mean, I got hot. Tyler Ulis, uh, he used to be on my team. He used to find me all the time. And he uh, he's the one that pretty much would have got me signed if I wouldn't got hurt because I laid it up because of him. So, Yeah, I mean, you talk about it as a fraternity, and that's <clears throat> it, it, it seems like, you know, that's like – Luca Garza's main reason for continuing to try the NBA. Mm-hmm. Like he's on this two way contract, but he feels like if he goes over to Europe, he's kind of stuck in Europe. Right. Yeah. And, and now 
it's once you're in, you're in, but if you're on the outside looking in and kind of the situation that you're in mm-hmm. now, yeah. where is there still a chance for you in your mind to like get back stateside to get a chance to crack the league? Yeah, me personally, I feel like right now, I feel like if I went to G League, I might have a shot the way, especially the way I'm feeling, the way I've been shooting the ball. And and they say NBA is all about shooting. So, I mean, right. and my defense have been way better. Uh, I've really improved my defense. So, uh, right now, it's but it's also tough because if you come back to the States, then you won't have the opportunity to play in high level in Europe. Right. So and the money, like, is the money better over there, too? It's better than the G League. So, G League is pretty much you betting on yourself. So, because if you don't get called up, now you end up 42K. But yeah. then before tax, so but then over there you getting paid six figures plus, so it's at that at one point you just got to pretty much say like when do you want when do you want to keep trying to make a legacy or when you want them to start making money for your future and all that stuff. So I'm in that situation right now where I'm trying to figure that out. But I feel like if I get a, a Olympics, it's gonna be a great opportunity. So if I play good there. Well, that's, know. that's what I was going to ask. Like you come out of the world cup, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm following your Instagram story. You got like 10,000 people sharing your highlights yeah. <laughs> you know, after yeah. everyone and you're yeah. sharing every one of them along the way, mm-hmm. you know, the Royal Ivy clip that mm-hmm. was, you know, in the locker room was, was awesome. Yeah. And so it was just, it was really cool. Cause it felt like so many people were rallying around the story of South Sudan and mm-hmm. your team worldwide. Like did your agent start getting a ton of calls about you and feel like, Oh, Maybe our chance for Peter this next year is going to be different, and it elevated mm-hmm. the type of teams and, and opportunities you were looking at. See, that's the thing, though. Um, that's that was our plan. Is pretty much bet on myself and go to don't sign me for World Cup. Yeah, go to World Cup. If I play good, it's going to be a lot of opportunities. So I went to World Cup, did my part, and then I really don't know what's going on. I haven't gotten as, as many opportunities as I thought I should. I should have gotten, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I really thought I was I was gonna get more opportunities, even with the NBA, you know, because of shooting the way I shot. I ended right. up finishing top four in three points and with the least minutes. And so um, right now, like I, I'm just I'm just a man of faith, man. I mean, I don't. It's out of my control. Uh, I, I hope I would have got a. I wish I would have got a, those opportunities, but it's just not my time yet. So I just gotta keep working. So you've mentioned a couple of times you're a ma- you're a man of faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like has that has faith always been a part of your life? Mm-hmm. Like for, since day one. Like did you grow up uh, Christian or did you grow up Catholic? Like, you're, you're Catholic. Yeah, I'm, my mom's Catholic. My dad's Christian. So we grew up. I, my ho- the household's pretty much Catholic. We grew up as uh, Catholics. So uh-huh. yeah. and so still to this day, like you, yeah, yeah, it's, it's t- yeah. So we we pretty much yeah since day one. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm Catholic too. My wife's Catholic. You probably mm-hmm. saw the crucifix when you yeah. walked in. Yeah. Um, so, gr- like growing up, like, what did the faith mean to you when you were faced with like a war torn country? Mm-hmm. And how does like how do you just handle some of the stuff that you probably saw or your mother has dealt with her whole life? I know you've you lost your dad, you lost your grandpa. Like, is it faith that kept everything together? Yeah, my my mom my mom always kept us away from all that stuff. So we moved to Uganda with, when when uh, all the war was <clears throat> war was going on back in uh, South Sudan. So I never we never re- uh, really relived uh, lived through that. But uh, I know she I know she lived through that because she had to go back sometimes. But um, she always took us to church every Sunday. Mm. Uh, pretty much didn't want us to talk about was all the negative stuff. It was always trying to be positive and moving forward wow. and. That I think she's she she raises by herself, you know, until we got to states. Uh, even in the states, we she been a single mom the whole time. So, uh, just watching her, she's been a very, a very great ins- inspiration, and she's my number. She's my why, because you know when I say, I mean I ain't say, but you got to have a why to keep going in life. And and me, my why is my mom. And then when after I mean with that come with faith. So yeah, she been uh. She just pretty much just watching her and how she, no matter where she, what she was going through, you know, she always turned to faith, always praying, all that stuff. So it's really, uh, it's in my mind. And and then I, after I start start going through my stuff and start going through my dark, <clears throat> the dark times and and uh, the two up the other ups and down, I always went back to faith because um, if you control, like I keep saying, if you control what you can control and let let God control the rest, um, it might not be what you want or at the moment, but he got what's best for you in, in the future. So oh, I love that, man. Mm-hmm. That, that's great. And, you know, it's funny as you grow up, you know, you're close to 30 now. I'm 37. Mm-hmm. You know, your mom's amazing. You know, your parents are amazing when you're a little kid because mm-hmm. you look up to them. Yeah. But then as you get older, 
they become even more amazing to yeah. you because you you have a better understanding of like the sacrifices that they've made, especially in your situation where your mom, you know, was raising three boys on her own mm-hmm. and, you know, is, you know, traveling across the world, getting you guys to America and all that stuff. Like, I got to imagine as you get older, your mom becomes more and more of like a like a role model yeah. and also like a hero for you because mm-hmm. now you have a better understanding of what everything she, she yeah. had to go through to yeah. make this happen for you. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, she was always been my hero. She was my, um, yeah, I always looked up to her. But then once, like you say, once I got started growing up and started getting older, and even when I went back home, like I started understanding everything she went through and everything she's going through just to make sure that we're good. And, yeah, she's she's my inspiration for sure. Uh, there's nothing I would do for her. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I love hearing that. I mean, yeah. I, I've got three little boys now. <laughs> And I know how hard it is just with, with me and my wife to mm-hmm. raise them. And I just can't, I can't imagine, yeah. you know, so having to do it on, the, on, the, on your own while mm-hmm. also providing and working and, like, everything else that goes into it. Mm-hmm. Single mothers, single dads, like, it's mostly single mothers that you'll see. Just it floors me all the time. And yeah. I'm just, I'm always, so props to your mom. She's yeah. a real MVP, you know, not to steal. Facts. K- nah, KD, she but like, you know, yeah, that, I, I was waiting for you to say that. Yeah, no, nah, she is for sure, man. It's yeah. She, she's been through a lot and everything I'm doing is to hopefully one day repay her back. So I love yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was, I was thinking about it today, Peter, as, as, a, as looking up your stats and, you know, there's been a ton of great basketball that's come out of the state of Iowa. Mm-hmm. You know, we've had, you know, your Fred Hoybergs, your Lauren Myers, your Harrison, Harris. I mean, Harrison Barnes, Marcus yeah. Page, yeah. Uh, Kyle Korver, Kirk Heinrich, Nick Collis, and all these guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like I'm missing somebody. Uh, anyway, Utah's another guy. But out of all the great Kyle Korver, I think uh, mm-hmm. the other guys, most of them have made the NBA that have been good. Doug mm-hmm. McDermott is yeah, the one I was Doug, thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're probably, at least in my estimation, mm-hmm. the best Iowan to never make the NBA. Oh yeah, for sure. Do you think? I mean, have you thought yeah, about that before? For sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Because Reed, sure. Reed and I, your buddy Reed and I, mm-hmm. were talking about this today, and I was mm-hmm. like, I, I, I'm doing my research. I think Pete's the best Iowa basketball player to never make the NBA. Yeah, I for sure. Yeah, I mean, my yeah, my senior after my senior year, I for sure thought I was first rounder. So, yeah. I know. I mean, I'm not trying to bring it up, but like Marcus Page got a cup of coffee. Mm-hmm. Uh, Utah has played on a couple of ten days. Mm-hmm. Uh, Adam Haluska. So he was the other guy. Like yeah, Haluska yeah. spent a couple of years in the league on a roster, but he never played in a game. Mm-hmm. So he, he's the other one. But I think you're probably. I mean, you've definitely had a better pro career than Haluska had. Mm-hmm. So I think it's you, and that's not a title that you want. No, so hopefully no. at some point, like, yeah. <laughs> it's like you know the golfer, the the best golfer to never win a major. Like yeah. you don't want to be that guy. No. So so obviously you know this podcast now we're, we're wanting you to get in the right situation in mm-hmm. Europe. We're wanting you to blow it up at the Olympics and then get back stateside and get a chance in the league. Yeah, that's I mean that's the goal. But yeah, that's crazy you say that because I mean I always think about that too. Um, Cause yeah, when I when I work out those guys, the NBA players, I mean, it's not that much difference. So, man, I mean, God bless those guys. I mean, it was meant for them. Maybe it's just not. It wasn't meant for me. Maybe God had other plans for me. So that's that's the the the, the path that I'm going through right now. So right. Well, yeah. I mean, that's kind of going back to where we started with the Olympic team. Mm-hmm. You know, the NBA. Maybe that's not in the cards for you. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But what you guys are doing with South Sudan right now mm-hmm. is almost bigger in some respects. Than like a 10 day contract oh, in yeah. the NBA mm-hmm. because the impact with a war torn country uniting, you know, tribes, mm-hmm. uniting a country, uh, being the first team to ever represent South Sudan in the Olympics, mm-hmm. like there are going to be hundreds of millions of people watching that next yeah. summer in Paris. Yeah. Like it's, it gives me chills talking about it. What's that <laughs> do for you when you think about like what's ahead for the next 12 months for you? Yeah, I mean, I'm just really excited, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, I stay healthy, and uh, so I'm just I'm, I'm gonna work, keep working my butt off until then. But um, I'm really excited, looking forward to it because it's just another opportunity for not only for basketball, really, is for for the people home uh, to keep uniting those guy, uh, those people, and putting smiles on their face. Because when I went home, we're pretty we privileged, and not not uh, we're, we're lucky in, to be in the states because I mean, there's a lot of a lot of bad things back home and uh you know watching those people how poor it is and in the streets and all that stuff but to also see them 
happy, just uh, happy and smiling when we came and just celebrating with us. That's the main thing that I'm mostly looking forward to, and that's what's motivating me to keep getting ready and keep pushing myself so that when we, when we get to Olympics, we can hopefully win a few games or do something to make the country proud. So I'm really looking forward to it, and I'm excited. So yeah. is is Royal Ivy Sudanese? No. <laughs> No, he's a uh, African American, but he, yeah, uh, I thought so. Yeah. But I, I'm always confused with that with the Olympic coaches. Like yeah. you'll see John Calipari coach in Puerto Rico or something. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm like, how does how does this happen? So how did Royal Ivy become the South Sudan coach? He's he's Luol's he was Luol's uh, high school friend. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, not friend, teammate. And then out of Chicago, then, yeah, no, no, in uh, high school. Okay, where I, where did Luol? Uh, they grow? went to um, some academy. I forget. Because like the even because even the their coach their coach in high school he's in a in a staff too, yeah. So I mean that's that's how they pretty much because Lowell's the president. So yeah, he's, so he's the one he's put hired, it all together, yeah, put yeah. all those guys together. So I mean you don't have to be in the same country, or right? That I know, country, yeah. I know. You know, but he's pretty much trying to see. I mean, put together the best staff to uh, take us. What language? Do they speak in South Sudan? Because oh, I, I, I like we Wikipedia. Have there's like 15 languages. Oh, we have. Oh, it's over 15. It's a lot. Uh, but the main ones, pretty much, we speak English and Dinka, and then I man, there's two tribes, two main tribes in Dinka and Nuer. So you either speak one of those. And then, Do you speak both of those? No, I don't speak Dinka, but my mom speaks like seven or eight languages. So yeah, she speaks a lot of languages, and then and then Arabic too. So English, Dinka, and Arabic. Uh huh. Yeah, those are the main three. Well, Pete. I appreciate you coming over. Mm-hmm. I know you gotta you you keeping that body right right yeah. now. You've get your intermittent fast and you're probably yeah. starving right now. You gotta you got another I pickup game in like eighty eight. You sacrifice you're sacrificing your meal to do yeah. the podcast. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. But I can assure you, from now until the Olympics, but we're gonna be following you here on the podcast. We're gonna be cheering for you, yes, following so. your story. Hopefully. The goal is for someday you to shed the title of the best Iowa basketball player to mm-hmm. never make the NBA, and that's yeah. the goal. Yeah, uh, yeah, I hope so, man. But you just got to keep working, and we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully, guys takes me that one day. But right now, I just got to focus what I'm focusing on right now. So my next step is pretty much get a contract, play overseas, or maybe G League. I don't know. We'll see. This is all going to unravel sooner or later, so we'll see. Well, regardless, best of luck. Great to meet you. Thanks for coming over. Thanks for doing the podcast. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. It's Moonlight Grill. Yeah. It's a pretty good program. Broadcasting to the heartland. Sports stories for the every man. It's Moonlight Grill. Please follow us on Instagram You're loving us on Twitter too You download every part we do It's Moonlight Graham